Good evening, Tributes, and welcome back to Tales of the Hunger Games. I hope that you are all well and that you have had a virtuous week wherever you are. Before we begin, I would like to give my usual thanks to the fabulous Andrew McLean for all the art that he has provided for this series, as well as my patrons. Your financial pledge is much appreciated. I'm also going to mention the Tales of the Hunger Games Discord, where everything to do with this series is discussed as well as the general Hunger Games Discord, where tales are created based on your choices. If you want to find those links, check the description below, where you will also find plenty of other links to do with this series. Now, without further ado, let's go. The catastrophic ending to District 3's games the week prior had unfortunately resulted in unrest throughout the capital. But as District 2's games crept nearer, most of this exasperation turned to anticipation, with many citizens confident that these games would be some of the most exciting so far. Discussions also occurred within the capital at this time regarding the nature of this year's reaping for District 2, which usually saw volunteers fight in a non-lethal game for the role of tribute. Yet the most popular theory appeared to be that all volunteers would be placed into the reaping games together, and that the last eight male and last eight female volunteers standing would go through to District 2's official games. However, on the Sunday before the reaping, these rumours were put to rest, when a live announcement was made on Capital TV by Mayor Dalton, in which he stated that a record-breaking total of 49 male and 42 female youths of District 2 had volunteered for these games. This caused an audible wave of amazement in Snow Square, but Eugenia Raven still stated to her co-commentator for this week, Artulia Fling, that she was not surprised, to which Artulia replied that many of these youths may have wanted to gain some experience of these volunteer games, possibly without even intending to win this year. Mayor Dalton continued that in order to safeguard the fairness of the reaping process for these games, he had decided, after discussions with his advisors, that the 91 volunteers would be allocated at random into seven groups, that would each contain seven male and six female volunteers. Over the next day, each of these seven groups would compete in a standard volunteer games within the reaping arena, which saw volunteers ripping off each other's three bracelets until only one male and one female volunteer still held an intact bracelet that would see them earn the title of tribute. This announcement caused loud cheering throughout Snow Square, as citizens realised that they were about to watch a total of seven volunteer games within one day. Yet Dalton enthused viewers even further by stating that due to the unique nature of this year's reaping process, faux knives, bows and arrows and spears would be included in the reaping arena, and that every time a tribute was hit by one of these weapons, one of their bracelets would break off. Dalton announced, however, that this would of course lead to only seven male and seven female volunteers being reaped for the games, and that they would need one more male tribute and female tribute for these games. Viewers in Snow Square then watched in suspense, as Dalton stated that in order to try something different, a standard reaping would also be held, in which two of District 2's non-volunteer youths would be reaped for these games. As Dalton proceeded to grin to the camera, a mixture of murmurs, laughter and surprise was heard within Snow Square, and soon after, the announcement was ended. Over an hour before the first volunteer game began at 9 o'clock the next morning, Snow Square was already full of excited capital citizens, whilst Eugenia and Artulia reviewed the seven groups of volunteers, along with the reaping arena and faux weapons that were present. Group A's game was then completed in 42 minutes, and won by Diana Plinth, aged 18, and Victor Dalton, aged 18, who spent most of these games hidden in the outer swamps. However, when there were just two opponents left of each of their genders, they accidentally stumbled across each other and formed an alliance, before working together to quickly eliminate their remaining opponents. Following this victory, Diana and Victor were placed in an open-top car and driven to the station along the main road of District 2, where they were showered by citizens with many golden wreaths, flowers and items of food, although the latter was quickly discouraged by peacekeepers. The pair were then placed on the train that soon started travelling to the capital. During the 20-minute journey, Victor and Diana were quickly seen to by two of the AVOX stylists, Pixie and Iva, who washed them at the mud on their clothes and bodies, before dressing them in the appropriate clothes and grooming their skin and hair. 
This process was completed just minutes before the train arrived in Snow Station, where Victor and Diana were greeted by Rubius Dalton, Victor of the 86th Hunger Games, and his wife, Bonnie. They then escorted the pair to the accommodation tower, whilst the train returned to District 2 for the next pair of tributes from Group B. This game then occurred, and was won within the astonishingly short time of 17 minutes, by cousins Octavia and Romulus Dalton, both aged 18, who worked together from the start to dispatch of eight of their eleven opponents through extraordinary displays of weaponry, defence and cooperation. Romulus and Octavia were then placed on the train to the capital, and after bathing, they were prepared by Pixie and Ivor respectively, with Romulus opting to have his dark hair matted into braids, whilst Octavia's beige afro was carefully trimmed. As they were being prepared, Romulus ordered Pixie to turn on Capital TV, and she initially ignored him. Romulus then repeated his order, and as she continued to ignore him, Octavia jolted around and grabbed Ivor's wrist, before getting up and pushing his elbow towards the floor, then telling Pixie to do as she was told. Pixie looked shocked, but Octavia smiled and joked that she did not want to have to break this one's arm, whilst Ivor desperately tried to free himself. Yet as he tried to sign for help, Pixie quickly activated the screen feed, and highlights of their games were shown. Octavia let go of Ivor, and Romulus watched the screen and commented how strong he and Octavia looked compared to their opponents. For the rest of the journey, Octavia mocked the other volunteers for the way she and Romulus had eliminated them, whilst Romulus grinned at her commentary and drank a single glass of whiskey that he claimed would calm his reflexes. When the pair arrived in Snow Station, they were warmly greeted by their uncle Rubius and his wife Bonnie. Once they were in the limousine to the accommodation tower, Rubius allegedly had trouble controlling Octavia's excitement as they passed through the capital, whilst Romulus told Bonnie all about his latest exploits within the Dalton elite. After arriving in the accommodation tower and entering apartment two, Octavia spent almost 20 minutes marvelling at the interior decor, whilst Romulus looked out from the balcony and quietly took in the wondrous view of the capital. Yet with 10 minutes left before the next game, Romulus and Octavia headed to the screen in the main room to watch the analysis of Group C's game. This game was won by Felicia Nixon and Elianus Bokuk, both aged 18. They were seen to have efficiently defended themselves from other tributes during the early stages of these games, before forming an alliance and using a foe, arrow and knife respectively to eliminate their opponents. They even embraced in happiness as they were announced to have won these games, Although this made Romulus cringe in embarrassment, and Octavia joked that Felicia's head would look good on a spike. During Group D's game that followed, Romulus took notes on each volunteer's attack and defence strategies, along with their apparent strengths and weaknesses, whilst Octavia laughed raucously throughout, and her commentary appeared to amuse Romulus. As the games reached a stagnant point halfway through, Octavia examined Romulus's notes, and was impressed with what he had done also commenting that they could add to these notes after the training the next day. Chaos then occurred within the arena as acid rain poured in from the perimeter, and within a few minutes, the victors were announced to be Brutus Christie, aged 17, and Anastasia Dalton, aged 18, who were noted by Artulia to have each betrayed their allies within these games. Yet upon hearing Anastasia's surname, both Romulus and Octavia seemed confused and asked each other if they knew her. But after realising that they did not, they assumed that she came from the family's further side. Once the analysis for these games was completed, Group E's game occurred, and due to the earlier games that had taken place, along with the rain that had entered the arena in the previous game, the centre of the arena now resembled a thick bog, which resulted in over half the tributes being eliminated within five minutes of the gong. As Priscilla Quint, aged 17, escaped from what Artulia Fling dubbed the mud bath, she tripped and caught onto a bracelet that was attached to the wrist of Magnus Plinth, aged 18, who was hiding behind a rock. However, instead of realising that this was an accident, Magnus turned on Priscilla and ripped off two of her bracelets in revenge. She then turned and ran, before miraculously proceeding to win these games by remaining in the centre of the arena and defending her position with the knives from the two other remaining female volunteers. Whilst Magnus roamed through the arena, and tracked down the three other remaining male volunteers. Yet when the pair were announced as victors, they were both seen to roll their eyes in annoyance upon hearing each other's names. Furthermore, Priscilla and Magnus practically ignored each other during their car ride to the station, and most of the journey to the capital. However, whilst Priscilla was having her messy ginger curls straightened, 
and Magnus's blonde locks were being combed back over his head, he told Pixie that she would need much longer than this journey to make Priscilla look presentable. This resulted in Priscilla snatching the scissors from Pixie's hands and threatening Magnus with them, but as he laughed, peacekeepers entered the carriage, and the pair were subsequently separated for the rest of the journey. They arrived in Snow Station soon after, and were escorted down the platform with Rubius and Bonnie, the former of whom scolded the pair for their behaviour during the journey. He then added that they should have the decency to save this sort of conflict for the upcoming games, where it could be enjoyed by capital citizens. Once they were inside Apartment 5, Magnus and Priscilla watched the rest of Group F's game, to see Xenia Dalton, aged 18, winning within seven minutes through her strong spear-throwing skills, before strolling through the arena and finding the male volunteers. After finding Julius Paddock, aged 18, crouched behind a rock formation, Xenia explored and found the two other male volunteers. She then told them to follow her, before leading them straight past Julius, which allowed him to eliminate them by throwing his knives at their chests. As Xenia and Julius were announced to be the two victors of these games, Julius was heard to ask Xenia why she had helped him, to which she casually replied that he would be weaker competition if he reached the grand final with her. Julius gave Xenia a strange look, but she smiled back at him and waved to the camera as cheers were heard in the distance. Priscilla and Magnus both seemed surprised as they heard what Xenia said, and Priscilla commented that this sort of remark was unwise to say out loud, to which Magnus laughed and said that she was a typical Dalton, and Priscilla agreed. However, the pair then seemed annoyed with themselves for this amicable interaction with each other, and they quietly turned back to watch the screen. After the analysis of Group F's game was that of Group G, which saw most volunteers using their bare hands to pin each other into the mud of the arena, with one volunteer, Xantha, almost being drowned during these games by Gaius Dalton, aged 18. Minutes later, Gaius found his only remaining male opponent and eliminated him in a scrappy sword fight. He then found his twin sister, Cordelia Dalton, aged 18, and they proceeded to work together in order to eliminate the remaining female volunteers. Yet Sabina Heath, aged 17, followed the pair during this time, and eventually threw a barrage of the faux knives at Cordelia's back, which saw Sabina earn the title of Tribute instead of Cordelia. This made Gaius so angry that he charged into Sabina and knocked her unconscious against a stone, which saw peacekeepers quickly enter in order to remove them from the arena. During the following hour before the reaping, Priscilla practiced her knife-throwing skills against a target on one side of Apartment 5's main room, whilst Magnus punched against a training dummy on the room's other side that was able to measure the force of his movements. Although they had their backs turned to each other for most of this time, it was noticed that Magnus was often turning around and appeared impressed with the precision of Priscilla's knife-throwing, while she gradually showed more intrigue and admiration for Magnus's strength, especially when his muscles pushed against his shirt. Yet after a while, Magnus noticed Priscilla and asked what she was looking at, to which she replied a mediocre tapping against a defenceless piece of polyester. Magnus frowned, but seemed to grin, and they briefly looked at each other a little longer, until Magnus apologised to Priscilla for what he said on the train about her appearance. Priscilla seemed pensive, and asked if he was only being nice so that she would ally with him in the games. Magnus hesitated, before stating that this was one of the reasons, but not the only reason, and Priscilla seemed surprised, but appreciative of his honesty. She then stated that she would like some time alone, and Magnus agreed, before heading to his bedroom for the next hour, where he lifted various heavy objects, whilst Priscilla painted her toenails gold within her own bedroom. After almost an hour, the reaping announcement was heard from the screen, and the pair returned to the main room. They watched in surprise as the square that was usually used for the tribute naming ceremonies was shown, but it now contained two large enclosures, one of which contained the female youths between the ages of 12 and 18, whilst the other contained their male counterparts. A few minutes later, Mayor Dalton was escorted to the stage with an elegant young lady on each arm, amidst a fanfare of jolly music from the orchestra at the back of the stage, whilst many youths, especially those of a younger age, appeared scared or nervous. Dalton then stated that he was incredibly proud of the 14 volunteers that had been selected to represent District 2, before flurrying his cloak black with a swish, to reveal the gold cane that lay beneath, which he jerked out and pointed upwards. He continued that two more fortunate young things were about to receive this honour as well, before stating, It could be you! and suddenly pointing his cane to a young girl with frizzy hair at the very front of her enclosure, which made her gasp. Dalton then shouted, It could be you! 
and jolted his cane across the aisle to a slightly older boy whose mouth was open in apparent shock at the time, although after hearing this, he quickly slammed it shut. Dalton grinned and widened his eyes at this boy, before jauntily creeping over to the female reaping bowl and licking his lips as he submerged his hand into the names. He breathed out in pleasure and plucked one from the depths of the bowl as a collective gulp sounded within the female enclosure. He then opened the paper, looked left, right, then back to the girls, and read, 14-year-old is Mini Focha. The camera immediately found a young lady in a tatty orange-yellow dress with long fair hair and white skin that grew even paler over the next few seconds as her mouth fell open. Ismini very slowly looked around, but most of her peers were looking towards the ground or trying to avoid her gaze. Rubius was now in the commentator box with Eugenia, and whilst peacekeepers came to collect Ismini, he stated that she must be from an area known as the Salt Flats, that he stated was infamous for its poverty and degenerate population. Ismini was now shaking weakly, and her eyes widened as she crept closer to Mayor Dalton, who was grinning once more and beckoning her with his gloved hands. Ismini fainted, and the peacekeepers quickly caught her, then practically carried her to the stage, where they propped her up against the female reaping bowl. Dalton looked at Ismini like she had just caused him a minor inconvenience, before swishing his cape again and walking melodically towards the male reaping bowl. He hummed a merry tune as he rummaged his hand around the bowl several times, before suddenly stopping and gasping dramatically towards the male enclosure, which made some of the younger boys jump in surprise. Sixteen-year-old Florian Liu was then announced to be the male tribute, and the camera swiftly panned in on an average-sized young man with tan skin and a short black side cut, whose expression had quickly turned to that of horror. However, as Florian looked back up at the camera, he seemed to calm himself to some degree, and slowly walked towards the aisle, but he was still shaking in dread as he moved closer to Mayor Dalton, whose smile was growing wider. After almost two minutes, Florian had finally been escorted onto the platform by peacekeepers, and he looked across in dread at Ismini. Florian gingerly approached the mayor, who then jolted out his hand, which made Florian jump. Mayor Dalton eyed his own hand, and Florian very quickly shook it, which made Dalton smile, and he turned back to the enclosures of relieved youths. As peacekeepers lifted Ismini to her feet, Eugenia stated how surreal it was to see tributes of this calibre from District 2, to which Rubius joked that he could not agree more. Eugenia then betted that Florian would be straight out, whilst Ismini could potentially last half an hour, and Rubius responded that this could be the case if they were both lucky enough, but that neither of them would survive a pack of elites. Within ten minutes, both Florian and Ismini were sat in the main carriage of the train that was taking them to the capital. Several peacekeepers were placed in this carriage, and their presence alone seemed to convince this pair to sit quietly in their assigned seats. After almost ten minutes, Florian tried to ask Ismini how she was feeling, but she casually ignored him, whilst looking out at the desert and rocks on her side of the train. More time passed, and Florian became restless, before heading to the bookshelves at the opposite end of the carriage, from which he quickly grabbed a book at random that was shown to be about the history of the games. He appeared to read this book for the next few minutes, but the camera could see that he was in fact muttering to himself in a daze behind its cover. Meanwhile, Ismini turned pale once more, before marching to the bar behind her and grabbing a bottle of whiskey. The peacekeepers watched in intrigue as she forced it open and drank its contents, but after spitting out a few seconds later, she quickly burst into tears and shook on the floor behind the bar. Florian then came over and tried to reassure Ismini, but she said nothing in return, and he soon returned to the bookcase, although he simply lay on the adjacent sofa for the rest of the journey instead of reading. Once Florian and Ismini had arrived in Snow Station, they were immediately driven to the accommodation tower, where they were allocated to apartment 8. Unlike the other apartments, peacekeepers were present here, and they kept a firm eye on the pair. Ismini almost immediately headed to her bedroom, whilst Florian explored the apartment a little more, but he was disappointed that the peacekeepers forbade him from going onto the balcony, although he did not dare to argue with them. Yet after a few hours of watching the Bunga games, Florian appeared restless, and he knocked on Ismini's bedroom door, asking if she would like to watch the volunteer games together. There was no answer, and Florian returned to the main room, where he began to play the game for Group A, that was won by Victor and Diana, which he watched in apparent dread. However, after a few minutes, Ismini sheepishly joined Florian, much to his surprise, and the pair watched these games together, 
They appeared equally phased and intimidated by the fighting that occurred throughout, whilst hardly even finding the words to comment on what they were watching. Yet when Diana won and smiled victoriously to the camera, Ismini ran back to her bedroom, whilst Florian continued to watch with widened eyes. That night, Rubius came to visit each of the apartments, and it is known that he spent almost an hour talking to Romulus and Octavia. During this time, the trio initially relaxed and rewatched some of the other volunteer games, whilst commenting on the threat levels of the victors. They then practiced a little with the limited equipment in this apartment, which allowed Romulus to throw small spears against a mark on the wall, whilst Octavia fired some plastic arrows at a painting on a different wall. Rubius alternated between helping them both, but also encouraged them to practice their defensive stances as well. However, once half an hour had gone by, Octavia became restless, and after spotting Romulus about to release his spear at another target, she grinned and shot an arrow just above his head, which made him jump and shout in anguish. Octavia laughed as Rubius proceeded to tell her off, but she quickly explained that this was simply a joke, and Romulus soon forgave her. Rubius then watched Octavia shooting the arrows a little longer, before reminding the pair to get a decent rest, and he left soon after. Yet Magnus and Priscilla's visit was much shorter. Rubius introduced himself and spoke for just over five minutes about what would be expected of them the next day, and how they could avoid antagonising the other tributes. He then answered a few quick questions from Magnus, before excusing himself and heading to the next apartment. As for Florian and Ismini, they were not visited by Rubius, despite Florian hearing Rubius speaking to his nephew, Gaius, on the balcony below. Whilst Ismini appeared unbothered by this, and sleepily headed to her bedroom, Florian allegedly became very angry, and insisted that he be offered help from Rubius like the other tributes, but this resulted in him being knocked unconscious by the peacekeepers before being carried to his bedroom. The next morning, most tributes were eagerly awaiting to head down to the training centre by the time Rubius came to awaken them. Once they had entered the centre, tributes were given some time together whilst Rubius watched from the mentoring gallery to see most tributes discussing and laughing about their victories in the volunteer games. However, Rubius also noticed that Florian and Ismini were stood to the side of this group, and Florian appeared to be trying to calm Ismini, although she was continually telling him that she needed space. Ismini soon became exasperated, and this exchange seemed to amuse Octavia Dalton and Diana Plinth, who had been talking on a nearby bench about their respective victory partners. The training then commenced, and whilst most tributes immediately headed to a weaponry station, Magnus Plinth appeared more interested in the large obstacle course at the side of the room. He quickly completed it three times, with the latter becoming the quickest time that any tribute had completed the course so far. As Magnus proceeded to rest, he loudly mentioned this new record to the other tributes, and Julius Paddock rolled his eyes from the adjacent archery station. After a while longer of trying to improve this time, Magnus noticed his Ismini and Florian approaching the obstacle course, and he moved on to the sparring station, where he began by fighting against a member of training staff, until Brutus Christie asked if he could fight him instead. The boys were reminded of the fair fight rules by Rubius, and the fight began, which quickly attracted the attention of most other tributes. As the two most muscular tributes, Magnus and Brutus both managed to enact some rather impressive manoeuvres, and even threw each other through the air at times. When the fight was declared to be over, Brutus and Magnus shook hands and the former left whilst Priscilla Quint came to speak to Magnus. During the training time that preceded this fight, she had been performing brilliantly in the knife-throwing station. At the suggestion of Rubius, Xenia and Anastasia Dalton soon joined Priscilla, and threw knives on either side of her. This initially appeared to phrase Priscilla, but she maintained her standard of accuracy before moving to the endurance station. Priscilla was joined soon after by Felicia Nixon, and Rubius appeared very surprised by how supportive the girls were towards each other as they tried to maintain their pace. When they both appeared to need a rest, they spoke about their thoughts on the other tributes, but most notably Magnus and Felicia's partner, Elianus Bocuck. Yet it was then that the girls noticed Magnus about to fight Brutus in the sparring station, and so they joined the other tributes that were watching. However, as this fight ended, Priscilla surprisingly asked if Magnus would fight her as well, to which he initially laughed, but after realising that she was in fact being serious, many of the tributes that had been about to resume their practice quickly came back and encouraged Magnus to accept. Although he initially had reservations, he eventually agreed, and the pair fought, with many tributes cheering on Priscilla for her bravery. She was easily beaten by Magnus, but she did throw in some punches and even managed to hold him against the floor for a few seconds. As the fight was ended by training staff, 
Priscilla was applauded by many of her peers, and once they had moved back to other stations, Magnus congratulated Priscilla for her efforts, to which she smiled and asked if he would now like to ally in the games. Magnus appeared slightly taken aback by Priscilla's change of mind, but he accepted, and the pair moved to the archery station together. Meanwhile, Romulus Dalton had spent most of the morning's first half in the sparring station, where he appeared to ignore the other tributes as he fought with a member of training staff. Yet after a while, Romulus looked over to see Victor and Gaius Dalton resting in the fencing station, and he joined them, before challenging them both to a fight. Whilst Magnus and Brutus were fighting on the other side of the centre, both Victor and Gaius worked hard to beat Romulus, but he ultimately emerged victorious against them both, and after a while, they appeared distracted by Florian's persistent efforts to complete the obstacle course, which was making Gaius in particular laugh uncontrollably. As for Octavia Dalton, she had leisurely roamed around the centre at first, whilst looking carefully at various other tributes practices and appearing to make mental notes on their strengths and weaknesses. She laughed when she noticed his meanie falling from the monkey bars of the obstacle course, before turning around to the gallery to see Rubius trying to get her attention, and pointing to Sabina Heath, who was performing very well in the archery station below. Octavia then headed over to the station, and without speaking to Sabina, took the target next to her, and began to shoot arrows with extremely high levels of speed and accuracy. This seemed to phase Sabina slightly, and although she continued to accurately shoot her own arrows, she quickly became distracted by Octavia's breaths of excitement as she hit each target. However, as Magnus and Brutus's fight began in the station behind them, Sabina decided to watch them instead, and Octavia continued to shoot some more arrows at a leisurely pace as most other tributes watched the two fights that followed. Romulus came down and joined Octavia soon after these fights had ended, and the pair spoke for almost half an hour about what they had seen so far at the other tributes, along with any potential alliances that they thought they could see forming. After this conversation, Octavia moved to the fencing station, where she could see Diana becoming annoyed with the member of training staff, whilst Romulus headed to the adjacent spear-throwing station, where Elianus was trying to improve his aim even further against one of the two targets. However, mere seconds before Romulus was about to grab the other spear, Magnus reached the station before him and grabbed the spear, before facing towards the target. Romulus then ordered Magnus to put down the spear, as he had been about to use it, but Magnus ignored him and threw it at the target. Elianus watched in surprised amusement as Romulus shouted louder at Magnus, who laughed and told him to find another station. Yet as Magnus turned around, Romulus punched him in the back of the head and a fight ensued between the boys, which saw the training staff rush over to separate them. Romulus was then allowed to stay in the station, where he seemed to have an indirect competition with Elianus for the rest of the morning, and Priscilla beckoned Magnus to join her in the knife-throwing station, where she helped him improve his routine further, whilst listening to his grumbling about Romulus and the rest of the Dalton family. Octavia and Diana had also watched Romulus and Magnus from the fencing station, where the girls had been fighting at the time. They both started their practice very well, and performed impressive routines that often outwitted each other's intelligence. Yet after Diana had won a second set in a row, Octavia jokingly became annoyed, and threw her sword just two inches above Diana's head. Training staff immediately rushed over, but they were perplexed to realise that there was no fight they needed to end, and both girls were now laughing. Diana then cackled and called Octavia a cow, to which Octavia grinned and replied that she knew Diana liked long swords, and so this was why she had thrown it for her. Meanwhile, Florian and his meanie both seemed nervous, scared, and extremely intimidated by the other tribute skills. Yet after a while of unsuccessfully practising within the plant station, Florian noticed Magnus leaving the obstacle course, and so he suggested that they head there. Their subsequent practice was pitiful compared to that of the other tributes, but they both managed to complete the course in relatively respectable times, and his meanie seemed slightly less scared. However, Julius Paddock came over soon after, and joined them in this station, which seemed to intimidate the pair once more, and Florian suggested that they head to the plant station, to which his meanie agreed. Yet she then became distracted by Magnus's fights against Brutus and Priscilla, and after appearing to have trouble breathing, she ran to the fabric station and hid within two sheets of tool layers, where she breathed slowly and watched the other tributes. Meanwhile, Florian watched from afar as Magnus and Brutus fought, before manically appearing to try remembering all the different components in the toxicological station, but this ultimately proved ineffective, and he rested in a daze for the rest of the training time. As for his meanie, 
she continued to look out from within this fabric, whilst appearing wide-eyed and terrified by what she was seeing. Shortly after her fight with Magnus, Priscilla walked past this station and quietly asked Ismini what she was doing here, to which she gasped in terror and cowered. Ismini then begged Priscilla to not tell Rubius, but she gave a weak smile and moved onwards to the knife-throwing station, whilst Ismini rested there for the remainder of the training time. Over that afternoon, the Dalton Studios were decorated in stunning golden statues of former victors and notable citizens, whilst the tributes were adorned in a variety of matching colours. Their garments were also selected by Pixie and Ivor to showcase their strongest skills that they would be likely to use within the upcoming games. After Diana and Victor's unforgettable interviews that scored them both a seven, it was the turn of Octavia Dalton, who came to the stage in a dazzling golden gown that enunciated her slender physique, whilst a sparkling bow and arrow was placed within her trim afro, which received strong applause as it came into view. Following the judge's positive comments, Octavia shot arrows at targets throughout the stage, before shooting with the bow behind her back, then through her legs, with one arrow even going through Rubius's hair. He jokingly relayed that he had been telling Octavia to not shoot near people's faces since she was seven years old, which triggered laughter from the audience as she mischievously grinned. Octavia then joked that she could not resist, and the questioning followed. She once again did well, and mentioned that she could reload her arrows very quickly. Artulia asked Octavia to prove this, and she proceeded to shoot and reload four arrows in seven seconds, whilst also darting around, which she claimed could stop other tributes from targeting her as she reloaded her bow. Octavia was then scored 7-8-7, seven, seven, according to the judgement of Eugenia, Rubius and Artulia, which saw her score 7 overall, and she left the stage with a curtsy amidst applause from the audience. Following her was Romulus, who came to the stage in a remarkable golden three-piece suit and golden studded braids, with Eugenia stating that she would touch his spear any day. Romulus grinned and opted to sword fight against a peacekeeper for his chosen skill, and through a mixture of controlled skills and quick reactions, he scored an impressive 12 to 1, which received waves of rapturous applause from the audience. Romulus' questioning also went swimmingly, and when Artulia asked how he would avoid even the chance of encountering poisonous substances, he responded that he would not eat or drink within the arena. He stoically added that he had trained himself to go without water for three days, and food for eleven, which even appeared to surprise Rubius. Romulus was then scored 8-8-7, which scored him the first overall score of eight from this year's tributes, and as the audience cheered loudly and gave Romulus a standing ovation, he grinned and nodded in agreement. The interviews of Felicia, Elianus, Anastasia and Brutus followed, with each of these tributes scoring a 7, except for Anastasia, who also scored an 8 with an iconic knife-throwing display. Priscilla's interview followed, and to the surprise of some, she wore a relatively plain golden dress, that appeared to hold pockets of a slightly different fabric all around, that was thought by some fashion critics to be an unusual choice. Yet after some opening comments, a target was brought out, and Priscilla began to rip these pockets from her dress, revealing that there were knives within, which she threw at lit targets on the wall with lightning precision. Some targets disappeared shortly before she threw the knives at them, but she still threw these knives effortlessly at where the targets had been. For her questioning, Priscilla remained calm and collected, whilst maintaining her smile. Rubius also asked how she would deal with the tsunami in the arena, to which she replied that she would try to kill the other tributes before the tsunami could reach them which appeared to cause confusion, but laughter within the audience. Priscilla then scored 7-7-7, seven, 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 which gave her an overall score of 7, but although she seemed pleased, she too was allegedly annoyed once she arrived backstage. Following Priscilla was Magnus, who came to the stage in a golden waistcoat and trousers, but no shirt, which allowed his enormous muscles to be the centre of the audience's attention. After some very positive comments from Eugenia that Magnus graciously accepted, he announced that he would be weightlifting. He held a 100 kilogram bar, then more and more weights were added, whilst the audience cheered in suspense and admiration as Magnus's muscles bulged beneath the bar. The audience's positive reaction increased even further until he reached the record of 123 kilograms before opting to stop and bow amidst a standing ovation from the audience. Magnus completed his questioning very well, and appeared to impress Artulia in particular with some of his answers. When asked about animals in the arena, he also stated that he would not be stupid enough to name one after Artulia or Eugenia, 
as they were far too beautiful, and as Eugenia jokingly fawned over this statement, Rubius coughed, and Magnus stated that he was of course beautiful as well, which triggered laughter. Magnus was then scored 878, which saw him receive an overall score of 8, and he roared in triumph as he left the stage. The subsequent interviews of Xenia, Julius, Sabina, and Gaius were also strong, but to the apparent annoyance of each of these tributes, none of them managed an overall score of 8. It was then the turn of Ismini, who looked ready to cry as she walked the runway in a plain but pretty golden dress, which naturally saw her receive less applause from the audience. As she returned to the stage, Eugenia was even heard to say that it was strange to see a tribute like this one wearing gold. Ismini then announced that she would be making a toxicological concoction from plants for her chosen skill, and for the next few minutes, she haplessly grinded a pestle of mortar into various seeds and leaves, before adding water and placing it in a jar, then claiming that this mixture was poisonous. After a brief silence, Rubius laughed loud, which caused more laughter from the audience. But as Ismini looked ready to burst into tears, Eugenia asked if Rubius would like to try this mixture, and he laughed off this suggestion. However, after trying to rally the audience on her side, Rubius eventually admitted that it was potentially poisonous, and he swiftly moved the proceedings onwards. Ismini then struggled with the questioning that was led by Rubius, and he focused on her ability to fight against the other tributes that they had seen so far this evening. However, she soon began to cry, and Rubius stated that she was not so clever now. Eugenia tried to continue Ismini's questioning at a slightly more leisurely pace, but it was now almost impossible for her to talk through her tears, and she was subsequently scored 4-2-3, which gave her an overall score of just 3. Following this rather pitiful display was the final interview with Florian, who calmly walked down the runway in a sparkling golden suit. Like his meanie, he received less applause than the other tributes, but he seemed to ignore the audience, before stating that he would like to avoid holograms for his chosen skill. Yet this display was done surprisingly well, and over these two minutes, Florian was only hit by two holograms, which Rubius admitted to be better than expected. However, he struggled with the questioning that was led by Rubius, which included how he would deal with three tributes attacking him at once, to which he was unable to give a decent answer. Rubius grinned, and asked as well how Florian would deal with the disadvantage of not volunteering for the games like the other tributes, but he quickly fired back that this would in fact be an advantage for both him and his meanie, as the other tribute would most likely not see them as threats, and therefore focus on attacking each other instead. This brave response and rational explanation appeared to impress the audience, and even Rubius nodded in agreement. Florian was scored 5-3-5, which gave him an overall score of 4, and he seemed relieved that this was not lower. The interviews then ended, and the tributes were taken back to the accommodation tower. The next morning, tributes quickly prepared themselves for these games, and after a final appearance check from Pixie and Ivor, they were taken in pairs to the roof of the accommodation tower where they were blindfolded and placed into the hovercraft that flew each pair to the nearby arena before coming back for the next. Once all tributes were in their holding rooms, they were ordered to dress in the golden tank tops, black shorts and white trainers that were provided. They then prepared themselves both physically and psychologically, whilst Rubius came to see off the six Dalton tributes. However, it is noted that he did not visit any of the other tributes, which appeared to cause confusion to some, but they soon refocused their attention to the upcoming games. Shortly before midday, the tributes were ordered to enter their tubes, and after a brief delay that was allegedly caused by Ismini making a futile attempt to escape her holding room, all tributes were standing in their tubes. The clocks then hit one minute before midday, and the tubes rose into the amphitheatre floor. District 2's games took place in the original amphitheatre. As this iconic location came into view, cheers were heard throughout the capital, with an allegedly deafening level of cheering and applause coming from Snow Square. Rubius then happily relayed that this location was indeed the original amphitheatre, which had been used over a hundred years ago for the first ten Hunger Games, as well as twenty-four years ago for the unforgettable Reclamation Games. After the cheers had finally died down, Eugenia began the tour of the arena. It was revealed that the oval-shaped floor of the amphitheatre measured approximately 100 metres in length from west to east, and approximately 50 metres in width from north to south. Surrounding this oval were the stands of the amphitheatre. These stands were three storeys high on all sides, 
and contained stairwells and corridors within that could be used to travel around these stands. Furthermore, due to erosion within the bricks of the upper floors, some parts of the roof could be accessed through gaps in the walls and ceiling, as well as alcoves of flat roof above the second floor which overlooked the oval. It was also stated that due to radical terrorist activities during the Second Rebellion, most of the seating, tunnels and corridors on the southern side, as well as part of the eastern side, had been destroyed, but not rebuilt, as part of a decision by President Gould to remind capital citizens of what had been lost during the twelve years of time now known as the Dark Days. The southern and eastern sides of the amphitheatre were therefore heavily decayed, However, this provided many tight spaces and crevices within the ruins of these walls, as well as several small blocks around the southern edge. Rubius then continued the tour, and to many viewers' surprise, he stated that this arena was not only limited to the amphitheatre, but tributes would also be allowed to travel within 10 metres of its edges. The perimeter was formed by a wide ring on the eastern and northern sides of the arena that contained triggered explosives beneath its grass whilst the southern and western sides of this perimeter were mainly guarded by armed peacekeepers, who had allegedly been told to only shoot tributes if they attempted to pass them. Meanwhile, within the amphitheatre, the sixteen podiums were placed equidistantly around the edge of the oval, with tunnels just two metres behind each podium. A horizontal rectangular area that had been known in the reclamation games as the Death Drop was covered by metal flooring for these games, and a total of 12 golden weapons were spread out over its surface. These 12 weapons were comprised of three spears, three swords, three sets of three small throwing knives, and three bows that each held three arrows attached. It then appeared to come as no surprise to viewers that there were no other forms of food, drink, or any other supplies within the arena, and as Rubius finished the tour, he stated that he could not wait to see how this turned out. Whilst the podiums entered the arena, many tributes grinned and seemed happy as they appeared to hear the distant cheering of Snow Square in the distance. Most tributes then looked around at whoever stood next to them or the weapons that lay ahead, whilst President Gull wished that the odds be in their favour, and the countdown started from 15 seconds. Octavia was stood on a podium at the far western end of the oval. She looked ahead for a while, and after spotting a bow and arrow that lay directly in front of her, she waggled her fingers with joy and appeared ready to jump from her podium there and then. A few seconds later, Octavia caught the eye of Romulus, who was stood a few podiums to her right in the southwestern side of the arena. He nodded back to her and smiled, then focused his eyes back onto a spear that lay directly in front of him, whilst ignoring the other tributes around him. Meanwhile, Priscilla was placed on the podium directly opposite Octavia, at the far eastern end of the oval. As the countdown continued, she smiled coyly towards Xenia and Victor, who stood either side of her, then quickly looked around until she appeared to spot Magnus, who stood along the northern side of the oval. He had initially been focusing on a sword that lay ahead. Before looking around, and upon spotting Priscilla to his left, he appeared to nod his head towards a northeastern tunnel that lay approximately halfway between their podiums. Priscilla subtly nodded towards this tunnel as well, then looked back to the knives that she appeared to be targeting. As for Florian, he was stood along the centre of the northern side, two podiums to the right of Magnus. While Sabina and Julius eyed him from the neighbouring podiums, he appeared scared, and it became clear that he was not even going to attempt to take a weapon. He then spent a lot of the countdown looking into the dark tunnel behind him, before looking back ahead towards his meanie, who was shaking on a southern podium. Tears had been falling down her cheeks before her podium even entered the arena, and she seemed to be in a daze as the countdown began. Yet when Ismini heard Brutus laughing at her from the adjacent podium with just three seconds remaining of the countdown, she suddenly seemed to come out of her trance and turned towards the tunnel behind her. The gong then sounded, and whilst most tributes immediately sprinted forwards, Ismini turned and ran south into the darkness of the tunnel behind, whilst Florian ran into the tunnel that lay behind him on the opposite side of the amphitheatre. Octavia sprinted straight ahead towards the nearest arrow, whilst excited cheers could be heard from Snow Square. Yet as she ran, she appeared to notice that Sabina was aiming for this weapon as well from the other side of the oval. Octavia passed through the last metres before the bow and arrow, while Sabina appeared to sense that she would not reach it before Octavia, and she quickly stopped and scurried back as other tributes ran in for the other weapons. 
As Sabina turned to run, Octavia snatched the bow and arrow before darting back and shooting an arrow at the back of Sabina's head, which knocked her to the ground. Octavia then turned to the right and shot at Felicia, who was impaling Anastasia with a spear through her back within the middle of the oval. However, Felicia had noticed Octavia about to release the arrow, and she quickly pushed Anastasia's head in front of her own, which saw the arrow hit Anastasia instead. Octavia cursed, and looked further to her right to see Elianus just a few metres away, where he had just stabbed one of his knives into the back of Victor's head, and he looked up to see her. Yet as more shouts of pain, terror, and victory flowed through the amphitheatre, Octavia pointed her arrow towards Elianus's heart, whilst he appeared ready to throw a knife straight towards hers. As for Romulus, he had run in from the southwestern side of the oval and grabbed the nearest end of a spear, before quickly running backwards as he watched the fights beginning on both sides. A knife suddenly flew towards Romulus from Julius, who was stood further along the line. However, Romulus quickly ducked and held onto his spear, before looking back to see Julius now running past Felicia, who had just jabbed her spear into the back of Anastasia. Romulus breathed out quickly, but looked to the left to see Elianus slowly backing away from Octavia and towards him. As Romulus watched, he appeared to notice Octavia darting her eyes between himself and Elianus, who was now holding out a knife towards her. Elianus then proceeded to turn away from Octavia and towards Romulus, who launched the spear towards his heart, before running forwards to retrieve it, whilst Elianus collapsed to the ground in pain. Octavia ran towards Romulus, and the pair held their weapons as they watched the surviving tributes, either fighting or fleeing into the tunnels with their own weapons. Xenia and Gaius then ran towards them from the southeastern side of the oval, but instead of looking ready to fight, Romulus and Octavia spoke to them in a frantic manner, amidst the chaotic sounds around them, and Eugenia stated that they appeared to have entered a Dalton alliance, to which Rubius grinned and responded that it appears this way indeed. Meanwhile, when the gong sounded, Priscilla had run straight into the eastern side of the oval towards the knives that she had been eyeing, which she grabbed, before throwing one straight towards Diana, who had just snatched the adjacent spear a few metres away. However, Diana ducked, which caused the knife to miss her, and as Priscilla threw another at her heart, she somehow managed to push this spear in its way, which caused it to bounce off and nearly hit Brutus, who was about to attack Gaius. This caused Priscilla to gasp, and she readied herself as quickly as possible to throw the third knife, but before she could grab it, Diana launched the spear directly towards Priscilla's chest. Magnus had also run in and grabbed the sword, but instead of fighting like most of the other tributes, he quickly ran back to the northeast, towards the tunnel that he had been eyeing during the countdown. Whilst the cheers of excitement raged in Snow Square, Magnus watched with amazement as blood splattered around the centre of the oval. Then he watched with annoyance as Priscilla's two knives missed Diana. However, as Diana threw her spear straight back into Priscilla's heart, Magnus looked annoyed and swore. He then turned to run into the tunnel, but before he could start running, he appeared to notice a spear flying towards him. Magnus quickly ducked and the spear entered the tunnel behind him. Then as he turned to see where it had come from, he was tackled against the stone wall by Brutus. Magnus tried to slash his sword back towards Brutus, but he swiftly kicked it away and punched Magnus's face against the wall. Brutus appeared to be trying to crush Magnus's throat with his bare hands as Magnus tried to push back against him. A few seconds passed, and it appeared that Magnus was choking, but he pulled one of his hands free and punched Brutus's throat, which caused him to back away slightly. Brutus then lunged his arm towards Magnus, who swerved, and this caused Brutus to yelp as he tripped into the wall and his bare knuckles hit the stone. However, Magnus grabbed Brutus by this hand, and before he could move, Magnus smacked Brutus's head against the stone with such force that he immediately collapsed to his knees, whilst his head scraped down the side of the stone wall. Magnus then jolted around and noticed that most surviving tributes were now fleeing, except for the Daltons, who were looking towards him and Felicia, who were the only surviving tributes within the oval. Magnus therefore snatched up his sword from the nearby ground and ran into the tunnel ahead, as five cannons sounded, which he appeared to count as he ran through the darkness. Meanwhile, Florian had sprinted through a tunnel to the north of the oval, whilst hearing the carnage occurring behind him, but this seemed to increase his speed as he ran. Within 30 seconds, Florian had reached the corridor at the northern end of the amphitheatre, and he twisted around in a panic as he heard running sounds echoing through the building behind him.
He spotted the steps just a few metres to his right that ascended to the second floor, and he sprinted up two flights until he reached the hollow corridor of the third floor that contained several holes along its stony exterior. Florian came to a sudden stop as he looked around, but after hearing the shouting and screaming echo through the stairwells below, he noticed a large gap in the wall that looked over the oval below and seemed large enough for him to pass through. Florian quickly squeezed himself through this gap and seemed pleased to see the stone ground beneath his feet and the remains of a few small walls that lay just ahead, which could be used to shelter him from the view of others below in the oval. As the five cannons then sounded, he scurried behind the furthest wall to the edge and peered over to see the four Dalton tributes having a discussion on the southern side of the oval. Florian rested a little longer behind this wall, whilst trying to control his breathing, and he gradually calmed down over the next few minutes, as he realised the relative safety of his position, until a scream was suddenly heard on the ground below that was swiftly followed by another cannon. Meanwhile, Ismini had been running through one of the southern tunnels when the first bloodshed occurred. She began to cry and breathe erratically as the screams echoed after her through the tunnel, but she continued through the shallow ruins that lay within the southern side of the amphitheatre, until she found herself charging towards the row of armed peacekeepers beyond. Ismini came to a sudden stop just a few metres before them, but they remained completely still as she glanced along the row and eyed their guns. She jolted around as she heard shouting from Julius coming through a tunnel behind her, then instinctively turned and ran back towards the peacekeepers. However, as Ismini reached just two metres in front of one of the peacekeepers, he quickly pulled up his gun towards her, before those either side of him also pointed their guns towards her, and a kind of domino effect occurred as she watched on in intrigue. Yet she then seemed to understand and sprinted back, before hiding behind a large block within the southern end of these ruins. As Julius came running through and looked around for other tributes, Ismini was seen to cover her mouth from behind this block. But after briefly looking around and eyeing the peacekeeper's guns, she appeared to hear him running to the west. Ismini peeked her head out and watched Julius running into the open walls of the amphitheatre's western side, but as five cannons sounded, she jumped in terror and quickly ducked down once more. However, Rubius stated that this was extremely fortunate for Ismini, as a few seconds later, Diana ran through one of the southern tunnels, and she would have likely spotted Ismini if she had not been hidden behind the stone block. As Diana looked around and walked within these ruins, Ismini once again covered her mouth and nose. Then as Diana came nearer, tears were even spotted to fall from Ismini's eyes. Diana proceeded to sit on another block that lay just five metres to the north, whilst Ismini remained hidden. Yet when a scream was heard from the oval to the north and another cannon sounded, Diana grabbed her spear once more and ran to the west, in the same direction as Julius. Once she was out of sight and earshot, Ismini let out a sigh of relief, and very gingerly came out from behind this block, before looking around, but as the hovercraft flew in from above to collect the bodies, she cowered down behind the block again. As for Magnus, he had been one of the last tributes to leave the Oval alive. He ran straight through the tunnels until he reached the corridor at the northern end of the amphitheatre, before resting for a while as the five cannons sounded, and he appeared to be finding his bearings. Magnus then ran up the nearest set of traps until he reached the third floor, which was the highest in the amphitheatre. He very cautiously kept to the wall, and held his sword out in front as he moved east along the corridor, and Eugenia jokingly stated that he was not so cocky now. Yet he then found a small gap in this wall, through which he could see a few jagged blocks that one could use to climb onto the roof of the amphitheatre. Magnus heard a scream that was followed by the sixth cannon, and he appeared to worry as he heard footsteps echoing through the floor below, before quickly approaching this gap and forcing himself through, then up onto the roof that surprisingly contained a few small sections of brick wall. Magnus watched as the hovercraft descended and used its death claw to collect the bodies of the six fallen tributes. As it left the amphitheatre, he looked further along the roof and noticed some loose bricks just a few metres along the wall, but as he slowly crept along, his right foot suddenly slipped and he began to tumble down a slanted slide of the roof. Crowds in Snow Square gasped along with Magnus himself, as it looked like he was about to meet an early end, but as he neared the edge of the roof, he managed to grip onto one of the walls with one hand, and his sword that had also slipped down the wall with his other hand. Then after an agonising minute, he finally found his footing. Viewers applauded as Magnus slowly clawed his way back up the roof, but during this time, he appeared much more focused upon the Daltons, who were still creating a pile of the weapons within the oval below. However, amazingly, yet fortunately for Magnus, 
They were too busy talking amongst themselves and practising with the weapons to notice him, and he proceeded to climb back to safety. Octavia, Romulus, Xenia and Gaius had reconvened within the southern side of the Oval following the bloodbath, where they made a pile of the fallen tribute's weapons. Xenia then approached Brutus, who was lying unconscious by one of the northern tunnels after his encounter with Magnus, but as she pulled the sword from his hand, he suddenly twisted around, which appeared to explain why only five cannons had sounded so far. This movement made Xenia scream in shock, but as the other Daltons darted around to see Brutus desperately trying to get to his feet, she sliced her own sword across his neck, and a few seconds later, the sixth cannon sounded. It was also noticed during a later replay of this incident that after Xenia screamed, Octavia had immediately looked at Romulus and gave him a knowing look, but he simply grinned and winked back to her. For the next 20 minutes, Octavia and Xenia guarded the pile of weapons in the centre of the floor, whilst discussing the remaining tributes and which ones they would like to kill, along with how they would like to kill them, with Xenia choosing to kill Diana with a sword through her face, whilst Octavia opted for the little one by using her bare hands. As for Romulus and Gaius, they practiced their archery skills by shooting arrows against a series of crosses that Romulus had carved into the rock with his spear. Eugenia and Rubius focused on this pair for some of the time, and they managed to improve their aim slightly, but were still missing some targets by a few inches. Yet after some more time had passed, Octavia stated that she was becoming bored, before suggesting to Xenia that they look for some of the other tributes, and that they would have more luck finding them together whilst the boys watched the pile of weapons. Xenia eagerly agreed to this idea, and the boys agreed to watch the weapons. As the girls decided where they should go, they looked over the upper floors to their north, but failed to spot Florian and Magnus, who quickly ducked behind the walls in their respective hiding places. Octavia therefore suggested checking the southern side, to which Xenia nodded contently, and as the girls readied their weapons to head through the southern tunnels, Eugenia switched the camera feed to Ismini, who was still hiding behind one of the blocks near the row of peacekeepers. She appeared to hear the rising cheers of Snow Square in the distance, then peered over the block towards the tunnels that lay ahead. She remained still and looked ready to crouch back down, but upon seeing Xenia coming out of a tunnel that lay just 20 metres to her left, she threw herself down again and breathed quickly but deeply. Ismini then gasped and very carefully poked her head out to the left of this block, whilst Octavia and Xenia noted and discussed the line of peacekeepers that they could see ahead. They then gradually turned back to face east, and his meanie quickly hid behind the block again. Ten seconds passed as Octavia headed west and Xenia headed east towards his meanie, who appeared to have no idea of which direction they were walking as she remained hidden behind the block, until Xenia shouted that she could see steps within the whole of the amphitheatre's eastern wall, but after hearing how close Xenia's voice was to her position, his meanie jumped up and ran to the east. Xenia quickly shouted as his meanie ran behind the outer southeastern wall, and from apparent impulse, she threw her sword towards her, but it narrowly missed his meanie's shoulder before flying towards a peacekeeper, although he quickly jumped out of the way and it went flying behind him. Xenia clumsily apologised and ran forwards for her sword, but to her annoyance, the peacekeepers brought their guns up to the ready and she quickly realised that she could not pass them, so she ran back to Octavia, who still had her bow and arrow. Octavia had seen this near miss, and she watched as his meanie disappeared around the edge of the amphitheatre, while Xenia became annoyed to suddenly be unarmed. However, Octavia reassured her that they had at least moved his meanie from her hiding place, and that she would likely run into another tribute soon. Xenia appeared consoled to some degree, and the girls headed back to the Oval, where they relayed these events to the boys, and as Xenia rearmed herself with some knives, she appeared to be looking very intently to the eastern side of the amphitheatre. Meanwhile, his meanie had continued to run anti-clockwise around the outside of the amphitheatre, and passed the row of explosive grass. She appeared very cautious as she continued forwards, whilst carefully checking that neither Xenia nor Octavia was running up behind, which caused her to be turning back and forth in an unsteady pattern, and Eugenia joked that she looked broken. Ismini then stopped along the northern side of the amphitheatre, and it was only then that she appeared to notice that the line of peacekeepers had now been replaced by the grass. She crouched down and rested against the wall, before breathing out in exhaustion, and continually looking both ways, but as she stared deeper into the grass and appeared to mutter to herself, a cracking sound was suddenly heard within the floors above her. Ismini looked up for a split second to see several bricks falling towards her, and she threw herself to the west, which resulted in only her foot being hit with the end of a brick. She gasped, 
then jumped and quickly limped west, whilst hearing Julius muttering salt-flat scum from above. Ismini continued to run through her tears, without any more apparent concerns, until she reached the western side of the amphitheatre, and the line of armed peacekeepers resumed as the explosive grass ended. She once again appeared torn as to where she should go, and even asked the peacekeepers if anyone had come this way, but they naturally remained silent. Yet a painful shout was heard coming from the inside of the amphitheatre behind Ismini, followed by a thud. She gasped and rested, whilst listening to an unintelligible conversation that was occurring from within the amphitheatre until a cannon sounded. Ismini then ran south as the hovercraft entered from above. She briefly hid behind the decayed edges at the western side of the amphitheatre, but after peering round and noticing the corridor that lay within, she muttered to herself for a while, before entering and hiding within some dilapidated brick walls. Meanwhile, Magnus had remained on the northeastern roof of the amphitheatre. He continued to rest behind the jagged wall and watch the Daltons, whilst tending to his leg that he had scraped earlier when he slipped on the roof. He then hid as the group looked in his direction, but as the girls headed through the southern tunnels, he seemed confused, then continued to watch the boys. Two minutes went by, and the commotion of his meanies near miss was heard, which was soon followed by the girls heading back through the southern tunnels and telling the boys about what had happened. Yet as Magnus struggled to hear what they were saying, he looked to his right and saw Florian peering out from behind the wall on the oval side of the third floor. Magnus then grinned and readied his sword, before carefully climbing down and passing back through the narrow gap in the wall, then creeping west through the corridor with his sword at the ready. Viewers in Snow Square cheered as Magnus checked every opening in the wall along this corridor while some of Florian's supporters shouted at him to run whilst he could. A minute later, Magnus reached the alcove next to the one in which Florian was hiding, but whilst Magnus looked through the gap in the wall, Florian seemed to sense the incoming danger, and he looked towards the gap in the wall that he had used to access this alcove. Magnus then slowly walked along the corridor towards the alcove of Florian, who finally appeared to hear these footsteps, but as he got up and looked around, he spotted Magnus looking back at him through this gap in the wall. Florian breathed out in a panic, and tried to rip off the nearest piece of brick, but Magnus gave him an ironic smile before sliding through this gap and holding out his sword. Octavia then spotted Florian from the ground below, and she alerted the others as he scurried back along this alcove from Magnus. Florian begged for mercy as he continued to pull on this piece of brick, but it was of no use, and after Magnus sliced the sword into Florian's chest, he fell back from the wall and yelled in pain as he hurtled towards the ground below. Magnus then briefly peered over the side of the wall as Octavia readied an arrow in her bow. However, just before she fired this arrow at Magnus, he noticed her and jumped back, which caused the arrow to hit the wall above him instead. As Octavia gasped in annoyance, Magnus jokingly shouted over the top of the wall that she was such a bitch, but Octavia smiled and shouted back that Magnus would have done the same. He then laughed and responded that this was true, before scurrying back through the wall, and seconds later, Florian's cannon sounded. Magnus carefully headed west along this corridor, whilst resting at regular intervals and appearing to listen for any other tributes. For the first few minutes, none appeared, but he suddenly stood still as he heard footsteps coming up the steps to the west. Magnus immediately held out his sword as he hid behind the nearest wall, but he slowly let down his sword and appeared very surprised as Felicia came into view, although she jumped and squealed a little as she turned left to see Magnus. He quickly held his finger over his mouth, and once Felicia had calmed down, the pair very quietly discussed the other tribute's locations, but their guesses were analysed by Eugenia and shown to all be inaccurate. For the next few minutes, they whispered together some more about who had killed whom so far. Then Magnus surprised Felicia by offering her an alliance. However, she responded that she had never liked him in the academy, and that she had always found him rather arrogant, so she could not promise that she would not be tempted to betray him. Both Magnus and viewers appeared shocked by Felicia's admission, but she promised that she would not give his position away to others, before wishing him luck and sliding through the gap into a nearby alcove that overlooked the oval. Meanwhile, the Daltons debated between themselves within the oval as to whether they should remain in this location or hunt through the tunnels and corridors of the amphitheatre for other tributes, with Octavia suggesting that they stay and Guy suggesting that they move, although Rob Mullis and Xenia seemed unsure between the two options. Eventually, Octavia stated that she may agree to move soon, but that she wanted to stay in this position for another half hour, which Gaia seemed to accept. During this time, 
Senia continued to practice throwing knives against the crosses on the wall, whilst Octavia and Gaius looked out at the upper floors on the northern side for any sign of another tribute, but to no avail. Romulus even hid within the southern tunnels in the hopes of ambushing other tributes, but nobody walked past. Most other tributes were now still hiding from each other and trying to stay as quiet as possible, so during this period of inactivity, Eugenia and Rubius analysed the momentous bloodbath from various angles for the best view of each death. An hour was then shown to have passed on the clock since the gong sounded, and to the surprise of many, Hornoplainty began to play, whilst the portraits of Victor Dalton, aged 18, Elianus Bocuck, aged 18, Anastasia Dalton, aged 18, Brutus Christie, aged 17, Priscilla Quint, aged 17, Sabina Heath, aged 17, and Florian Liu, aged 16, were all shown in the sky. This therefore left Diana Plinth, aged 18, Octavia Dalton, aged 18, Romulus Dalton, aged 18, Felicia Nixon, aged 18, Magnus Plinth, aged 18, Xenia Dalton, aged 18, Julius Paddock, aged 18, Gaius Dalton, aged 18, and his mini Focher, aged 14, as the nine remaining tributes. Whilst the Daltons had been discussing their next move within the Oval, Magnus headed back east, almost to the end of the third floor, before noticing a set of narrow steps on the outside wall of the amphitheatre that he had not yet seen. However, as he reached the top of these steps, he spotted a small piece of the wall that ran across this section of the roof, and he moved to crouch behind this wall, then rested there as he caught this breath. Magnus very carefully moved forwards and looked out over the edge of the roof to the drop that lay four stories below, before muttering, screw that, to himself, and resting behind this section of the wall once more. Yet as Magnus turned, he accidentally knocked a piece of stone with his foot, which fell off the side of the amphitheatre, and a few seconds later, a loud explosion was heard from the ground below, where the stone had hit the explosive grass, which resulted in a metre-long portion being detonated. This made Magnus jump, but he managed to keep himself from reacting too loudly, before very carefully looking over the side and realising what had happened. However, all the other tributes had at least heard the explosion, with the Daltons each looking to the north and the upper floors of the amphitheatre, and Octavia smiled as she appeared to wait for a cannon, whilst Romulus quickly jolted around to look into the southern tunnels. Xenia then grabbed her knives and stated that they absolutely had to see what caused this noise, and Gaius quickly grabbed his sword, before getting to his feet and agreeing with Xenia. Yet Romulus and Octavia seemed more hesitant, with Octavia stating that it could be a trap, and Romulus adding that they should think twice about giving up this safe position. However, Xenia urged them to hurry, before whoever had caused this explosion was able to escape, and Romulus and Octavia looked at each other, then grabbed their weapons and got to their feet behind Xenia and Gaius. As the quartet ran east towards the edge of the amphitheatre's wall, Romulus walked behind Xenia and asked if she was sure she was not talking malarkey, to which she replied that she definitely was not, and that they needed to move faster. Octavia glanced at Romulus and he winked at her as she caught up behind Gaius. Romulus then grabbed Xenia by the back and snapped her neck, whilst Octavia pulled a knife from her pocket and jammed it into the side of Gaius's neck. Xenia collapsed to the ground and her cannon sounded, whilst Gaius breathed out in pain and tried to claw at Octavia's feet. She then looked back down and gave Gaius an ironic smile, before stating that she had tried to warn him. Octavia and Romulus took the weapons from this pair and headed back towards the oval as Gaius's cannon sounded and the hovercraft flew in. However, just as they passed the wall, Octavia suddenly spotted his meanie gingerly passing across the raised platform above the southern tunnels. Over the loud sounds of the hovercraft, Octavia shouted at Romulus and pointed at his meanie, who immediately turned and ran back towards the opening in the amphitheatre's western wall. Octavia then shot an arrow, but his meanie was running to the west along this platform at the time and it narrowly missed her head. Ismini gasped as she ran along the corridor of the first floor and up the nearest stairwell, whilst Octavia and Romulus were quickly helping each other to climb onto the raised southern platform. Once Romulus and Octavia had mounted this platform, they sprinted west, whilst Octavia shouted taunts at Ismini, who was now running up the steps to the third floor. As the pair entered the second floor, Octavia continued to shout for her, but Romulus shushed Octavia as they ran up the steps to the third floor during which time Ismini had just run up a set of steps towards the western end of the corridor that led onto the roof. She very carefully looked around, 
whilst distancing herself from the steps that she had just ascended, but without falling off the side of the building. However, as she heard footsteps echoing up through these steps, she gasped and ran a few metres along the wall, then crouched down. Octavia and Romulus readied their weapons as they climbed these steps, and viewers in Snow Square watched in suspense as Ismini gripped onto the side of the roof and lowered herself over its side. Tears were seen to form in her eyes as her legs dangled over the three-storey drop behind her. Then Octavia and Romulus appeared at the top of the steps, where they held out their weapons and looked in round in confusion over the roof. The nearest camera even panned in on Ismini's pale fingers, but fortunately for her, their colour now matched the white of the roof's stone, and Eugenia commented that Ismini was fortunate here for her pale skin tone. While she continued to grip on with all her strength, she did appear to be struggling, and was mouthing something to herself during this time, until Romulus suggested to Octavia that they check along the floor below, and that Ismini may have actually continued along this corridor. Ismini let out a very weak smile during the silence that followed, but after a few seconds, Octavia tutted and agreed, before begrudgingly following Romulus down the steps to the third floor. As they proceeded along this corridor with their weapons at the ready, Ismini spent the next minute summoning the strength to pull herself back up over the side of the roof. For a while, it appeared that she was not going to manage this task, but she eventually hoisted herself onto the roof. As she rested in exhaustion and looked up at the sky, Ismini appeared to hear the faint cheers from Snow Square and let out a smile before mouthing thank you to the sky. For the next ten minutes, all tributes remained where they were, except for Octavia and Romulus, who slowly moved east along the third floor beneath his meanie. They proceeded to check each alcove that they passed, with Octavia whispering that they should find his meanie hiding inside one of these, although it was Felicia that the pair very nearly came across. But fortunately for her, she managed to climb to the next alcove and then back to this one, which stopped her from being found. After checking the whole of this floor, Octavia appeared most annoyed to not only have failed to find Ismini, but any other tribute at all. Romulus suggested that they return to the oval below, but it was clear that Octavia wanted to continue searching in the amphitheatre. She looked around, but just as she appeared ready to say something, the floor and walls around them suddenly started shaking, and the crowds in Snow Square cheered in excitement. Octavia shrieked as Romulus grabbed her by the arm and reassured her that it was only an earthquake. However, Octavia was clearly still scared, and she almost fell over as she lost her footing. A few loose pieces of brick then came down from the roof, including one that narrowly avoided Romulus' foot, and without any further ado, he and Octavia ran towards the nearby steps. They quickly found themselves grabbing onto the railings at the side, and although Octavia yelped as she slipped on these steps, the railings stopped her from falling. Romulus then helped her as she crawled onto the second floor, amidst more violent shaking of the building around them. A painful scream proceeded to echo through this corridor from the west, and he practically grabbed Octavia, then helped her down the final flight of steps to the ground floor, before turning and walking quickly, yet carefully, for the tunnel that led into the oval. Meanwhile, Ismini had remained on the western side of the amphitheatre's roof, where she rested following her close call with Romulus and Octavia. After a few minutes, she seemed to have regained her energy and began to look around, initially into the oval below, but then towards the upper floors and roof at the amphitheatre's opposite side. Yet as Ismini winced and focused on the northeastern section of the roof, she appeared to notice Magnus's minor movements as he readjusted himself behind one of the walls. Ismini continued to lie flat against the ground below as she looked over to where Magnus was hiding, but she appeared ill at ease, and it was clear that she no longer felt safe in this position. However, after another minute, Ismini walked back down the western steps and entered the third floor of the amphitheatre. She quietly rested at the bottom of these steps for the next minute, but just as she appeared ready to continue down to the second floor, she gradually appeared to hear the footsteps that were coming along the corridor from the east, which viewers could see to belong to Diana, who was currently in possession of three throwing knives that she held at the ready. Ismini quietly gasped as she realised that these footsteps were nearing her, and she quickly tiptoed west along this corridor and into the further set of steps, which she proceeded to walk down. Yet just as Ismini was nearing the bottom of these steps, Diana turned the corner to the top of these steps, and gasped as she saw Ismini in front of her. Diana immediately threw a knife towards Ismini, but upon hearing Diana, she had panicked and slipped on the bottom step, which ironically stopped her from being hit by the knife when it flew over her head. Ismini yelped and turned the corner into the next set of steps, and Diana continued to run down the upper steps towards her, until she turned the corner and spotted Ismini on this lower flight of steps. Yet just as she chased Ismini down this set of steps to the ground floor, the ground around them suddenly began to shake violently. Diana was about to throw this knife, 
for her aim was scuppered, and the knife flew almost a metre to the right of Ismini as she reached the floor below. Ismini looked towards this knife and appeared tempted to grab it, but as Diana continued to run down the steps, she was nearly hit by a falling brick from above, before tumbling down the rest of these steps and landing on her left shoulder, then screaming in pain. As Diana proceeded to clutch her shoulder, albeit with a knife in her hand, Ismini quickly seized her chance and grabbed the nearby knife, before running a few metres along the corridor to the nearest entrance to the oval. Diana continued to writhe in pain, with Rubius later suggesting that she was more annoyed to not have killed Ismini while she had the chance. Meanwhile, Ismini had run into the oval, and upon hearing movement coming from the centre of the amphitheatre's northern side, she sprinted towards the southern tunnels. She then passed through one of these tunnels just seconds before Octavia and Romulus entered the oval, which narrowly stopped them from noticing her, and as she caught her breath on the southern side of the amphitheatre, the ground gradually settled. Meanwhile, Magnus had remained upon the northeastern section of the amphitheatre's roof, and when the earthquake began, he simply gripped onto the wall and was relatively unaffected. Yet as the ground's movement ceased and he looked out to see Octavia and Romulus stood alive and well in the middle of the oval, along with the lack of cannons, he appeared surprisingly annoyed and restless. To the shock of viewers, Magnus brought his sword to his hand, and Eugenia frantically asked what he was doing, until blood began to drip from the cut that he had just made on his palm. He then slowly let the blood trickle along the top of the steps that descended next to the roof, before walking down these steps, and even rubbing his bleeding hand against the walls inside this gap in the wall, which gave the rather morbid impression that a gruesome death had occurred here. Magnus hid himself behind the wall on the roof once more, and viewers watched in amusement as he impatiently waited here, nursing his hand and occasionally peeking over the steps below for any sign of another tribute, but with no success. However, after just over 15 minutes, Magnus suddenly perked up upon hearing movement at the bottom of these steps, and he carefully held his sword out. He then heard the footsteps reaching the roof on the other side of the wall, before lunging out from behind the wall with his sword. Magnus very narrowly avoided slashing Diana's throat, and she ducked and gasped, but as he realised that she was not a male tribute, both Magnus and Diana lowered their weapons and carefully eyed each other. For the next few minutes, they shared what they had seen so far, and what they knew about the positions of the other tributes. Diana then shared her encounter with Ismini during the earthquake, and Magnus informed her about this failed attempt with blood to trap the male tributes. Yet Diana seemed pensive, before stating that she knew where Julius was hiding. Magnus said that he would like for Diana to tell him where this was, but he did not want to leave this position, especially if this gave other tributes the opportunity to attack him. Diana seemed to understand what Magnus was saying, but she responded that it would be dangerous for her to help any further. She then turned to leave, although Magnus suddenly grabbed her by the arm before informing her that he knew where Felicia was. Diana suddenly turned back and asked where, but Magnus told her to bring him Julius first and that he would reveal Felicia's location once he had killed Julius. Diana attempted to bargain with him for the next few minutes, as Eugenia joked that she had never seen anything like this in the games before. Yet just as Rubius began to comment further, Diana gave in to Magnus' demands. Many viewers watched in suspense as she headed alone down the bloodied steps and into the third floor, before carefully heading west, all the way to the far steps that lay on the outside of the amphitheatre's far end, at which point she whispered for Julius, whom she had spoken to here almost an hour ago. After appearing to realise that this was Diana, Julius climbed back in from these steps, and he listened as she explained that she had found a bloodied stairway on the opposite side of the amphitheatre, but did not wish to check it alone. Julius seemed unsure for a few seconds, but Diana offered him one of her knives, and he soon accepted her request. They carefully headed back along the third floor, whilst Diana appeared to have difficulty containing her excitement, until they reached the bottom of these bloodied steps. Without words, Diana prompted Julius to lead the way up these steps, and he slowly walked ahead with the knife at the ready as Diana followed him with a slight grin. Magnus was also seen from another camera to be holding his sword at the ready from behind the nearby wall, and Snow Square quickly grew quiet in suspense. Yet just as Julius reached the top of these steps and noticed the trail of blood ending, he suddenly looked back to Diana. He then furrowed his brow in surprise, and was clearly about to say something when Magnus suddenly jumped out from behind the stone wall. Magnus slashed his sword against Julius' neck with such force that his head almost flew off from his neck, and both he and Diana were showered in blood. Diana grimaced a little, but Magnus smiled as Julius fell back from the roof. He then hit the patch of grass below, and the subsequent explosion masked the sound of his cannon. The hovercraft entered within a minute, but whilst it began to pick up the pieces of Julius' body, 
Diana suggested that they move, so that the other tributes could not find them here. Magnus reluctantly agreed, and the pair headed back down the steps, then into the amphitheatre. But just as Magnus looked along both directions of the corridor, Diana pushed him against the wall and reminded him that she needed Felicia. Magnus paused for a second before nodding and slowly beginning to lead Diana west along this corridor until they had almost reached the alcove in which Felicia was hiding and watching the oval. Magnus then unintelligibly whispered to Diana and a few seconds later they each passed through small openings at different ends of this alcove. Felicia slowly turned around and appeared to sense movement against the brick walls behind her. She held out her sword before suddenly running northeast towards the nearest opening until Magnus suddenly jumped out from behind a brick wall, and she gasped in shock, then relief. Felicia frantically stated that Magnus had scared her, before asking what he was doing here. A second later, Diana jumped up from behind another wall and threw a knife at the back of Felicia's head, which saw her fall to her knees and looked painfully into Magnus's eyes. He then stated that he had never much liked Felicia either, and always found her too self-content for his liking, before pulling the knife from the back of her head, and a cannon sounded as she fell forward to the floor. Romulus and Octavia seemed to have heard some of this interaction from within the oval below, and they looked up in this direction, but upon hearing a cannon, Octavia stated that she hoped it belonged to his meanie. As Diana thanked Magnus for his help, Horn of Plenty played once more, and the portraits of Felicia Nixon, aged 18, Senia Dalton, aged 18, Julius Paddock, aged 18, and Gaius Dalton, aged 18, were all shown which left Diana Plinth, aged 18, Octavia Dalton, aged 18, Romulus Dalton, aged 18, Magnus Plinth, aged 18, and his Mini Focher, aged 14, as the five remaining tributes. As Diana watched the death claw taking Felicia's body, Magnus reminded her to stay down, and he pointed through a gap in the wall to the oval below, where they could see Octavia pointing an arrow up towards them. Through the air blast of the hovercraft above, Magnus said that they needed to move from this alcove, as Octavia and Romulus now knew where they were, and within seconds, Diana was leading the way back into the amphitheatre. Meanwhile, Octavia and Romulus were still in the oval, where the former was realising to her annoyance that Magnus had just moved from the alcove above. As for his meanie, she was still hiding behind an intact section of outer wall on the amphitheatre's southeastern side, yet as she continued to look through one of the arches, she suddenly noticed the peacekeepers talking behind her, then moving backwards, before looking behind them at five large trucks that were driving towards them. Once these vehicles had stopped, peacekeepers inside them removed a large crate from each of them. Ismini appeared confused, but when the peacekeepers began laughing to each other and a snarling was heard from within these crates, her expression changed to worry. Ismini quickly darted her eyes around both sides of the amphitheatre as quiet roars sounded from the crates, followed by loud bashing and she breathed out in fear as the peacekeepers continued to laugh at whatever was inside these crates. They all looked towards the head peacekeeper, who was stood next to the middle truck. He then looked ahead, and as his meanie ran back towards the southern tunnels, he gave a signal. Then the crates were opened. Just as his meanie was quickly climbing in a panic onto the platform above the southern tunnels, a loud set of roars sounded, and five enormous lions exited from the crates. She kept her head down as she lay flat on the platform, presumably in order to not be seen by Romulus and Octavia, who were starting to notice the roaring to their south, whilst the cheers mounted in Snow Square. However, Ismini turned around and watched in amazement as four of the lions ran north towards the amphitheatre, although she appeared more confused as painful screams were heard coming from one of the trucks. Unfortunately, one lion appeared to have been given the wrong treatment prior to this game, and instead of running south to attack the tributes like the other lions were doing at the time, it attacked one of the peacekeepers instead. The lion then bit deep into this peacekeeper's neck, which ultimately caused his death soon after. However, the other four lions fortunately did as they were supposed to, with two of them running towards the southern tunnels, whilst one ran towards the western side of the amphitheatre, and the other ran towards its eastern side. Magnus and Diana had now re-entered the third floor of the amphitheatre, but they were apparently unaware of the approaching lions that were running up within the stairwells towards them until Magnus suddenly stopped Diana's whispering, and the pair heard roaring within the lower floors. The pair ran to the oval side of the amphitheatre, and watched in shock through one of the gaps in the wall, to see two lions running towards Romulus and Octavia. Magnus gasped, but Diana pulled him back, and shouted that there was something coming, whilst pointing to the west, and at that moment, Magnus heard the roars of the lion that was now running east along this corridor towards them.
he quickly grabbed Diana by the hand and yanked her to the east. The pair sprinted ahead and down the next stairwell as quickly as they could without falling. They reached the bottom of these steps just as the lion appeared at the top, then roared and pounced forwards. Diana and Magnus sprinted west along the second floor, but within seconds they heard another lion running after them along this corridor. Diana even yelped and looked back occasionally as the lions became louder, but Magnus continued to run ahead without looking back. As they passed into the western half of this corridor, Magnus shouted at Diana to keep running, but he briefly turned around and saw one of the lions now running towards them. Then shortly after Diana had seen this lion, she yelped and tripped to the floor. Magnus continued to sprint ahead, and Diana quickly got to her feet, but let out a quiet scream as the lion pounced towards her. Meanwhile, Romulus and Octavia had not noticed his meanie climbing up onto the platform above the southern tunnels, but they did hear the two lions running towards them through these tunnels. Romulus quickly suggested grabbing weapons from their pile in the centre of the oval, and he grabbed a spear, whilst Octavia grabbed a bow and arrow, and the lions charged into the oval. The pair carefully waited until the lions had moved closer to them, and Romulus launched his spear into one lion's chest, whilst Octavia shot two arrows in succession at the face of the other, which quickly subdued these creatures. Octavia appeared relieved, but asked if there were more lions to come, to which Romulus stated that he was not sure, and as they heard the roaring within the upper floors of the amphitheatre's eastern side, Romulus grabbed another sword from the pile with one hand, and Octavia's arm with his other hand. He then dragged her towards the western side of the oval, before helping her up onto the raised platform, and she helped him up as well. They looked up as they heard the lion's roars, and Diana's yelping reaching the section of the amphitheatre that lay behind them. The latter sound then morphed into screaming, and seconds later, a section of the second floor's wall, that lay almost directly above Romulus and Octavia, suddenly came crashing through the air above them. Laughter roared through Snow Square as Diana, a lion, and countless pieces of rubble fell to the ground, just a metre to the right of Octavia, who jumped and scurried back. Fortunately for her and Romulus, they were only hit by small pieces of stone, and therefore remained unscathed, whilst Diana and the lion were both now barely conscious. As Romulus scurried back and jumped down into the oval below, Diana pulled a knife from her pocket and jabbed the lion through the head. Then as Diana's hand flinched, Octavia stabbed her through the heart, which sounded her cannon just a few seconds later. Whilst Romulus was quickly pacing backwards into the oval, he fell to notice that Magnus was running towards him from the western side of the amphitheatre, with a sword at the ready as he charged towards Romulus. However, Octavia looked up and saw Magnus approaching, before shouting at Romulus, as the sound of excitement in Snow Square could be heard to increase in the distance, and Rubius encouraged Romulus and Octavia to kill their opponents. Magnus almost managed to swipe his sword into Romulus's neck, but thanks to Octavia's warning, he jumped back at the last second and narrowly avoided being hit. The boys spent almost 20 seconds continually trying to hit each other with their swords, which resulted in an epic sword fight that was clearly distracting Octavia, who was now cheering for Romulus to kill Magnus. She even held her bow and arrow at the ready, but due to the constant twisting and turning in Romulus and Magnus's positions, she was clearly struggling to focus the arrow on Magnus, without worrying about hitting Romulus. Meanwhile, Ismini had been lying down against the southern platform with the knife held firmly in her hand as she watched Diana and the lion's deaths. She was also now intently watching the sword fight, but upon noticing that Octavia was distracted by this fight, she appeared to take her chance and jumped up. Ismini then ran across the platform towards the open side of the amphitheatre, and Eugenia stated that if she were careful, she could run along the western corridor and attack Octavia from behind. Romulus was still fighting Magnus, and although neither of the boys had managed to hit each other's bodies with their swords, it was clear that they were now both exhausted. Yet as Romulus suddenly spotted his meanie running across the platform, he shouted a warning to Octavia. Although Octavia was clearly distracted by this fight, she suddenly jolted to her right and spotted his meanie. Octavia then pointed her bow and arrow towards his meanie as she charged towards the inside of the amphitheatre's walls. Octavia shot her arrow, which flew into his meanie's throat, and she collapsed to the ground, just two metres from the amphitheatre. However, Octavia then gasped as she looked ahead to see Magnus kicking Romulus in the side of his head. It appeared that Romulus had in fact distracted himself as he called out to Octavia, and he briefly held his sword still, which allowed Magnus to jump forwards and kick him in the side of the head. Romulus' grip on his sword weakened, and Magnus twisted around, before slicing his sword through Romulus's neck. Octavia screamed for Romulus as he fell to the floor and gripped onto his neck, before pointing an arrow at Magnus 
and breathing heavily as she snarled at him. Yet just at that moment, Ismini suddenly crept to her feet and stumbled towards Octavia. She pointed her arrow back to Ismini and fired it at her chest, which knocked her back against the ground. Seconds later, Romulus's cannon sounded, and it was announced that Magnus Plinth was the male victor of District 2's games. Octavia screamed in anger, but Ismini somehow pushed off the ground and began to crawl towards Octavia once more. As Magnus breathed out in exhaustion and sat down, he watched Octavia grabbing a stray brick and charging towards Ismini, before continually bashing the brick against her head for the next ten seconds until her cannon sounded, and it was announced that Octavia Dalton was the female victor of District 2's games. Octavia shuffled over and lay against the wall as she looked ahead to Magnus, who was looking back at her with a weak smile. Yet as the sound of the hovercraft gradually became louder than the distant cheers in Snow Square, Octavia began to smile. The craft then came into view, and her smile grew as she laughed with joy, before shouting that she had won. Magnus looked at Octavia during this time with a pensive expression, but as the ladders were dropped from the hovercraft above, he responded, barely, which caused Octavia to stop laughing and dart an annoyed glance back towards Magnus, who grinned as he got up and walked to the ladder. Octavia and Magnus were then flown by the hovercraft to Gaul Hospital, where Capital Medics conducted health checks upon them, but due to their lack of major injuries, they were both declared to be in good health, before being taken back to the accommodation tower the next morning. Whilst Magnus and Octavia watched the complete footage of the games in their separate apartments, they were seen to by Ivor and Pixie respectively, who dressed the pair for their victor interviews which took place that evening. Eugenia excitedly welcomed the audience to these interviews, accurately stating that these were two of the most deserving victors so far, as well as the two who had the most chance of emerging victorious in the grand final. Octavia then came to the stage in a dazzling gown of white and golden twirls that twisted over her body. Her beige afro had also been laced with golden streaks that Eugenia seemed to greatly appreciate. Octavia's interview began with footage of her four kills being shown, and this saw her praised by Eugenia and the audience for her strong archery skills and strategic positioning throughout the games. Octavia also shared some brilliant banter with Eugenia throughout, and joked that she knew she would emerge victorious in these games. Eugenia then revealed that since achieving victory, Octavia had become known as Lady Dalton within the capital, due to her status as the only female Dalton victor so far, which seemed to please her greatly. Magnus then joined Octavia, and he came to the stage in a golden pair of trousers and a matching tie, the latter of which hanged over a tight white shirt that nicely displayed the extent of his muscles. Eugenia also joked that he could take off the shirt if it was uncomfortable, which caused laughter from the audience. Magnus's five kills were analysed, and the humility that he showed throughout this interview seemed to surprise some viewers. He even commended Florian and Romulus for the resistance they had shown, before admitting that fighting in these games felt like a strange dream, and that they were much more intense than he had expected, which clearly amused yet surprised the audience. Eugenia also mentioned that Magnus had become known as Mighty Magnus within the capital, and that he would likely have no problems getting sponsor gifts during the final, which made him smile, and soon after, the interview ended. Magnus and Octavia were then taken straight to Gaul Manor, where they spent most of their days until the grand final exercising and maintaining their mentality for these games. During the hour of each day that district victors were allowed to see their district partners, this pair initially had a bad rapport, with Octavia blaming Magnus for Romulus' death. However, as the grand final drew nearer, Magnus gradually convinced Octavia that they needed to work together to improve their chances of survival. It is also alleged during this time that President Gaul invited Magnus to join him in his mind room on a daily basis to play chess with him and his son Titus, whilst Coriolanus Snow III came to see Octavia on three separate occasions, but surprisingly she rebuffed his advances, reportedly stating that she needed no help to achieve victory. During the week that followed these games, the unrest within the capital seemed to subside. However, due to an unfound security breach that was likely caused by yet another Unidad sleeper cell, Thibaut Girardo and Begonia Shanks, district victors of District 11, were given access to a pair of wedding rings and a live streaming camera during one of their hours together over this week. They then locked the door and broadcast their wedding that lasted just five minutes in total. Although this camera was set to broadcast onto Capital TV 3 instead of Capital TV itself, this event was still seen by many citizens, 
which subsequently led to criticism of President Gould to not allow Thibault and Begonia to have a proper wedding ceremony, with some presidential advisers reportedly even stating that it was a missed opportunity. However, the newlyweds were punished for conducting this ceremony without permission, but to the surprise of President Gould and various other commanders, these punishments were criticised by many capital citizens. Some even seemed to pity Thibault and Begonia for the inhumane treatment that they suffered, with a few radicals stating that as they were both likely to die within two weeks, they should be granted mercy.